All right, good morning, everyone. This session will be closed captioned. This feature is available by clicking on the closed caption icon at the bottom of the Zoom application. A transcript will be provided upon request. Your mics are muted. Please submit questions or comments using the Q&A icon at the bottom of the Zoom application, and we will begin to attend to those following our panelists' remarks. Your name may be read aloud, so please let us know if you wish to remain anonymous. Hello and good afternoon. I'm Tabby Chavis, <clears throat> the director of the National Center for Institutional Diversity um, um, and also associate vice president for research and professor of education and psychology at the University of Michigan. I'm pleased to welcome you to uh, to our event today uh, in our, our, di our dialogue series, Forgotten Bodies, Conversations on Research and Recognition. NCAD's mission is to produce, catalyze, and elevate diversity scholarship. Our developed framework for diversity scholarship defines it as scholarship that helps advance our understandings of processes and phenomena related to areas such as difference, inequality, culture, identity, power, oppression, and as they impact individuals, groups, institutions, communities, and societies more broadly. Our catalyzing Michigan mission area includes bringing together interdisciplinary communities of scholars to support research engagement and innovation. And our elevation mission area includes making visible the important contributions and the legitimacy of diversity scholarship and diversity scholars and supporting the dissemination and application of their scholarship and informing and addressing critical societal issues. Today's event, the second in our series, Remaking a Life, How Women Living with HIV AIDS Confront Inequality, will be a conversation about the policies and activism that support the transformation of individual women's lives and the ongoing transformation of the HIV AIDS epidemic itself. On behalf of NCID, I'm thrilled to welcome an exciting interdisciplinary group of diversity scholars to lead us in this conversation on research and recognition. Thank you again for joining us today. And I will now turn the program over to Ashley Woodson, NCID's assistant director. Ashley. Thank you, Tabby. The title of our series is borrowed from poet Claudia Rankin's declaration, I am invested in keeping present the forgotten bodies. Each conversation provides models of relevant, necessary research that resists past patterns of exclusion and expands our sense of community. We invoke Claudia Rankin's words and the words of today's dialogue leaders as an act of remembrance, saving space for those whose lives and words have never been acknowledged, but nonetheless directly inform our efforts today. We are indebted to their sacrifices and hope that our time together inspires new avenues of honor, restitution, indemnity, and justice. Representing our conversation on social media is Maya Glenn, a first year PhD student in sociology. Her graduate research agenda examines how black women are sexually socialized more broadly. She is also interested in how black women experience intimacy, express agency, and come to claim various sexual identities. Thank you, Maya, for your facilitation. Follow Maya and us at UMichNCID and represent this space using the hashtag Forgotten Bodies. Now to introduce today's conversation leaders. Our featured author is Dr. Celeste Watkins Hayes, a professor in the Department of Sociology and in the Ford School of Public Policy and University Diversity and Social Transformation Professor at the University of Michigan. She is the author of Remaking the Life, How Women Living with HIV AIDS Confront Inequality. Our guests will offer 10 minute remarks in this order. Dr. Alfred A. Young Jr., the Edgar G. Epps Collegiate and Arthur F. Thurnaw Professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Michigan. He also holds an appointment at the institution's Department of Afro-American and African Studies. His primary area of research has been on low-income African-American men, where his emphasis has been on how they construct understandings of various aspects of social reality. Next, Dr. Vincent Hutchins is the Haynes Walton Jr. Collegiate Professor of Political Science and African Studies and University Diversity and Social Transformation, Transformation Professor at the University of Michigan. Y'all gonna have to forgive me while I get used to these titles. His general interests include public opinion, elections, voting behavior, and African-American politics. Finally, Dr. Daphne Watkins is a professor of social work and director of the Vivian A. and James L. Curtis School of Social Work Center for Health Equity Research and Training, also a university diversity and social transformation professor at the University of Michigan. 
She studies gender disparities and mental health over the adult life course using mixed methods research approaches. Again, Dr. Young, Dr. Hutchins, and Dr. Watkins will offer approximately 10 minute remarks on the book. After they share their remarks, Dr. Watkins Hayes will return with summative comments and we will take your questions from the Q&A. Full bios of all of our distinguished guests today are available on the Forgotten Bodies website and check out Maya's tweets to follow and advance the work of our guests on Twitter. I will return after the panelists comments as moderator. Let's welcome each panelist now beginning with you, Dr. Young. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for this invitation. Uh, thank you for having an opportunity to comment on a book that I have read actually some time ago. I feel like I was the first person to acquire a copy. It's, it's been with me for quite some time. And thank you for arranging this particular format for sharing ideas. I am particularly grateful that the design of this uh, discussion is centered on reconsidering paradigmatic approaches to dignity and to thinking about dignity. The issue of dignity for marginalized people has been central to my research agenda as it's unfolded over 25 years. And I am both humbled and pleased to say that in Remaking Our Life, how women living with HIV AIDS confront inequality. Dr. Celeste Watts Hayes has in one book done a better job of trying to advance how we can think about dignity than I've tried to do in those two plus decades of time. Um, it is very much the focus on dignity in this work that drives my attention, that centers the comments that, that, that I wanna make about the work and that I think is pertinent given the design of this conversation. What I like in particular about this book, and there's so much to like, and I apologize in advance for not being able to deal with the great many issues, 10 minutes is 10 minutes. But what I particularly like about the work is how she brings a sociological framework for understanding how dignity is often lost, but can be recovered for people that are experiencing challenge in their lives. Obviously, she's talking about women. Obviously, she's talking about women or confronting the HIV AIDS crisis. Also obviously, but perhaps less explicit, is that these women confront a series of additional circumstances and challenges that situate, in some cases, how they've come to acquire HIV AIDS, certainly how they live with it. Poverty being one of them. Abuse at the hands of partners being another. So many others. And what the work does, in, in my view, to help us situate a more responsible thinking about dignity is to not apologize for or avoid talking about the complexities of circumstances and conditions that bear upon these women's lives. It's also very forward in discussing how they have sometimes made choices that have exacerbated the conditions and circumstances that affect their lives. What we come to understand quite fully in this work is that social structure, culture matter. They play contextual roles in shaping both the choices that the women pursue, the options that are available to them, and how others external to their lives, or at least external to the complexity of their lives, may regard and think about them. And it is there that we can think about dignity, not simply as a human trait, not simply as the property of an individual existence, but a phenomenon that is cultivated, preserved, often challenged by the structural, the cultural context that shapes people's lives. And this is a consistent message that runs throughout this book, is that as we think about how these women come to realize there's a possibility for living, quite literally living through HIV AIDS, for some thriving, despite the fact of being afflicted by HIV AIDS, that all of that is situated in our deep responsibility to think about how structural and cultural context matter. By that, I mean that Professor Watson Hayes helps us think a lot about what kinds of social connections these women experience, not simply in terms of medical health professionals and the medical support industry, but other forms of contact connection, whether it's around employment, family management, personal care, and well-being, but how all these dimensions of social life come into play and the different ways in which women realize 
there's action they can take on their own behalf or there's support they can seek out or there are people in some cases or institutions they have to avoid. Right? Beyond that, she helps us understand that history matters, that there's no singular critical moment, there's no singular point in time, there's no key transformative moment, although transformation matters, right? that it triggers change for women, that we don't think about the individual commitment to change without thinking deeply about the social circumstances and context that create those possibilities in the first place. We also, in the course of this work, get out of what I think is a deep and penetrating problematic logic for thinking about people like the women in this study. And it's aside from whether we question the extent to which they have dignity or deserve to be responded to with dignity. The deep and penetrating problem is what I call a singular focus on an issue or a concern or circumstance that drives negative outcomes for individuals. Here, and even the title of the book may lead us to believe that HIV AIDS is all that matters. Right? That that's the critical issue, that's a critical concern. What Black and Hayes does for us is allow us to think about the multiplicity of issues and concerns that reinforce the so-called health problem that the women confront. And that moves us so critically out of what I think is still a deeply penetrating perspective in, 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 in poverty studies and in, in policy to a certain extent in the social work community that singular problems or concerns are all that we must confront. And that we can somehow make advance on a singular problem or concern by providing resources and attention to that problem. It is the totality of one's life that's at stake here and trying to intervene in ways that capture the complexities of the ways in which people intervene with each other. That poses a challenge for all of us. I received a message that my volume is not very loud. I wanna make sure that I'm being heard. Um, is this any better for folks? At least the panelists can hear me. <laughs> I can't speak for others. I hope all others can. <laughs> So with a little bit of time left, let me put forth a couple of points of, of consideration that I hope we take from this work and that I invite um, further conversation about. The first, and, and again, it's delivered in this work, but I think it calls for us to think more deeply about the structural, the cultural context. How might we better galvanize an understanding of how external parties in their behavior, in their action, in their inaction, create the basis for recognizing people as dignified, as enabling them to recognize themselves as dignified people. We see in this work that the twists and turns around HIV, AIDS mobilization, political mobilization, or social activism created opportunities for a different vision of HIV AIDS afflicted people. And that coincides with when and how these women at different points in their lives were able to say, I can survive this, I perhaps can thrive. All of that turns the attention to external parties and leaves before us the question of not simply how do we intervene, how do we treat individuals who are afflicted, but what might go on to better enable external parties who have access to critical resources to reimagine suffering people. Are there generic lessons here? Right? And we certainly see the need for such lessons given the particular pandemic moment we're living in now and questions of dignity and who gets regarded as a dignified individual abound. Second, how might we speak back to the policy and social service arena in understanding the role of history and change? By that I mean that and again, goes back to some of my earlier comments. We often think in terms of a singular intervention, right? And program providers, program funders often think in terms of quarterly or systematic evaluations of programs in terms of treating these singular problems or issues. Right? Yet we see in this work that people don't quite live their lives that way. It's not about engaging a program and feeling better or doing better four months later, five months later. There are twists, turns, developments, setbacks, as well as moving forward. 
and how might a policy of social service sector that is so steep, and I get why it's steep, right? Funding dynamics, what have you, are so steep in precise measurement of periodic returns. How do we get that kind of mindset to readjust when human development operates in a different pattern? How might we better capture that people might come to a better sense of themselves, might act in different ways, might be more responsive years later than moments of initial intervention? How might we better brace it in our service sector arena, the understanding that two steps forward might always mean a step back as life unfolds? So I've only just scratched the surface of some of the issues that we can discuss. And that's the power of this work. There's so many issues to discuss. But in allowing us to really forward dignity, not just as a project for individuals who are suffering, but for all of us who engage them, sometimes those of us who avoid them. There's a social property around dignity and a social mandate to think about it and pursue it more fully. And I'm grateful that this work has set that foundation. I'll stop there, I think, right precisely at the 10-minute mark. Thank you, Dr. Young. Remember that we are welcoming your questions in the Q&A. Dr. Hutchins. <clears throat> yes, uh, so I'm very happy to be a part of this panel. Um, there's a number of things I wanna say. I don't know if I'll go the 10 minutes, although I might end up going longer than I think. Um, first, let me just start by saying just how wonderfully written this book is. It was really, um, you know, the proverbial page turner, it was difficult to put down. So uh, Celeste, you really deserve a lot of, I mean, a lot of credit for that. In fact, there's a, there's a few things I wanna say, my comments will mostly be focusing initially on my reaction to the methodology em, uh, employed. And then I'll talk uh, a little bit about some of the things I learned from the project as well. Um, because given my own uh, methodological training as a, mostly as a survey researcher, I'm always fascinated when I read uh, work of the kind of uh, deep um, sociological analysis of the sort that this book involves, because I'm so impressed by it. It's so, it's so hard and so not the sort of thing that I do. And so this, so my comments are born out of that um, perspective. Let me just say that. So this is a project, if you haven't had a chance to read this book, by the way, please go out and buy it. You'll thank yourself for it. Uh, it's, a, it's rough at times but it's a very important learning experience. Um, the methodology involved cultivating relationships with women on the very margins of society for a, a long period of time, a very lengthy years and years period of time, uh, multiple uh, dozens and dozens of women. So uh, Celeste, I, I don't pretend to know how to do this. I've never done this in my own career, which is partly why I'm so fascinated by it. Uh, she obviously managed to build a rapport and a sense of trust with these women. She would be invited with them on doctor's visits as they discussed the most sensitive uh, and the life-threatening aspects of their um, circumstances. And I was just impressed throughout with that, with that part of the project. There's something else I want to highlight in addition to how well written it is and how impressed I was by the painstaking um, nature of the manner by which she gathered the data. Uh, and Al kind of touched on this a little bit as well. It was the, the complete lack of judgment as I was reading her discussion about these uh, women who had very disparate and desperate uh, circumstances in terms of their participation in the, as I think she put it, the sexualized drug economy and um, and other sorts of decisions they had made in part because of constrained options on, on the table for them. But at no point did I read any hint of judgment in the work. And maybe that's just par for the course in this manner of work, but I, I just wanted to give praise to her as an author uh, for doing that. It's probably part of the reason she was able to generate the rapport with the participants in her study because she was generally, it was clear uh, to them, and it was clear to me as a reader that she had a genuine interest in their well-being and understanding how they ended up where they ended up in their uh, life in terms of their efforts to live with, well, uh, to be dying from, but ultimately, ultimately to live with, and if they were fortunate, to thrive despite their HIV status. Um, so so uh, those are some of my positive comments about the book. Now I want to say a little bit 
um, in my time here, and I'm more interested actually in hearing from the audience than listening to my the sound of my own voice. So I, I don't think I'll go on too much longer. But I learned a lot of things from this. I thought I had a pretty good uh, handling on this issue. I'm, I'm actually from the San Francisco Bay Area. So when the AIDS uh, issue erupted initially in the early 80s, I remember as a high school student, this would have been around 1982 or so, I remember when this happened. So I've been, I, I thought of myself as fairly informed about the matter, but that was before I read this book. Um, one of the many things I learned that was really kind of telling about this issue from the perspective of not all, not all, but many times, uh, uh, in many cases, low-income Black women. In some cases, they were middle class. In some cases, they were uh, Black and, uh, excuse me, they were uh, Latina or white as well. But the focus of the book is on Black women and often low-income Black women. And um, I, I was uh, struck by the extent to which sexual trauma was a feature of their stories and uh, contributed directly, sometimes indirectly, to their uh, HIV status. It was um, it, it was just compelling and disturbing. Uh, it, like many of you in the audience, I suspect, and maybe even some of us on the panel, it's it doesn't take much of a leap to think about members of our own family uh, who have had similar struggles. And so, as I was reading Celeste's book, I was thinking about members of my own family. Uh, extended family who have had some of these struggles. So sexual trauma, the prevalence of it, the ubiquity of it, the routine nature of it, and the callousness of it uh, just came through as I was reading uh, the book and some of the various uh, individuals, participants in her study in their biographies. It was really heartbreaking, but illuminating and providing context, as I think Al was indicating, to how they, how do they get in these, these precarious circumstances. So the sexual trauma that they encountered uh, for me helped to provide a lot of context and, and explanation for the struggles they uh, that led to their HIV status and, and, uh, and also to the struggles that some of them faced in terms of not, they, there, this wasn't always a rosy scenario that was laid out. They didn't all ultimately thrive and despite their uh, diagnosis. Some didn't. And those who didn't, it was in part because of the trauma that they experienced. So that part, um, it's not that I had never heard of sexual trauma before reading this book, but I didn't necessarily appreciate the extent to which it is associated with um, some of the health challenges that are described in this, um, this very important manuscript or, or book, excuse me. Um, so that was one of the things I learned. The other thing that I learned had to do with the issue of class. Uh, really in two ways. One, in that ironically, the diagnosis for many of these low-income women, uh, the diagnosis of HIV, and if they were able to take advantage of the safety net uh, that has been developed around uh, the, this illness, um, it actually improved their economic circumstances, or at least stabilized it perhaps more accurately. And uh, I would not have thought that. It, do, it wouldn't have been something that would have occurred to me prior to reading this book. So uh, the author goes into a great deal of detail about why that is the case. Once they, and this is in part because of the work of activists uh, and some politicians over time developing an infrastructure so that individuals could take advantage uh, of the opportunities to get medical treatment and also to address the accompanying social ills regarding housing and other matters. Um, and so ironically, uh, this is not to say that being diagnosed with HIV is a good thing, but if you are mired in uh, the drug culture and all the attendant pathologies associated with it, um, an HIV status could, under some circumstances, provide the impetus to uh, straighten yourself out to a degree and, and the infrastructure taking advantage of that could actually stabilize your, your circumstances. That was really a telling insight, at least um, for, my, for my reading. Um, so that's how class was relevant in one way. It was also relevant in another way that I found surprising. And that was how middle class, for middle class 
uh, HIV, with people living with HIV, um, it could sometimes actually the you know, the very same structures that I made reference to could actually have a debilitating effect on them, uh, it, both economically and in terms of like the stigma, perhaps because they had more to lose than the individuals that I was describing uh, previously. So that those kind of counterintuitive findings um, were noteworthy and interesting to me and helped to make the book a rich um, experience in, in terms of learning about this world that is not a world that I'm familiar with. Um, and then I'll just say one last thing and, and conclude my comments and, um, you know, cause I'm looking forward to hear the, hearing the last panelists and also hearing the Q and A. Um, it, it, the ways, it was interesting, the kind of structural impact. And by that, I mean, the one of the running themes throughout the book is the way in which the women, the, these black women, low income women, um, recognize that the early efforts to address the AIDS crisis was dominated by relatively privileged white men. And that's not to disparage their uh, unfortunate circumstances, of course, but the, the point I'm trying to make is that the, uh, both as a biomedical uh, reality, but also as a kind of a social structural reality, the interventions that were that the devised uh, play to that population of relatively privileged white gay men. And it didn't necessarily, not because of any animus on the part of those uh, early activists. They, were, they had a problem, they mobilized to address that problem and it was appropriate for them to do so. But in fashioning solutions, they uh, perhaps inadvertently lost sight of how these solutions might not play uh, to a less affluent and uh, uh, you know, women or trans populations. And so that theme I thought was really uh, important because it was about how kind of inadvertent and structural components of these um, interventions could still leave women, poor women, black women, Latinas, uh, feeling less than served. Not again, necessarily because of any animus on the part of those, act those early activists, but just because they're the solutions that worked for them didn't necessarily work for that population. So that part I thought was really uh, fascinating. There's much more I could say about what I liked about the book, um, but I hopefully will get an opportunity to do that in the Q&A. And again, um, so I'll conclude on that point. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Hutchins. Dr. Watkins. Yes, yes. So um, there are, I imagine, both pros and cons to going last because I feel like some of the some of my thunder has been borrowed. I won't say stolen by my colleagues, but I'm hopeful that I can enhance some of the things that have already been said. So I too just want to start with just enormous praise for the book and the way it was structured. Um, just so easy to to read, and I would go as far as to say a page turner. I really enjoyed every every piece of it. I think my inner anthropologist was pleased, my inner mental health researcher was intrigued, and my inner Black men's health researcher, I think, was so satisfied by what um, I was able to follow. And so um, I had so many takeaways from the book that I wanted to um, and I, I've, of course, naturally given the given time, I won't be able to get into you know all of the takeaways, but just some what I call jewels that came out of the book for me that I really look forward to discussing in the larger group. Um, I I was struck by the beautiful way that I think Celeste you were able to amplify the voices of these women, and um, I, I felt like given what has happened in our country in even like the past twelve months. I felt like these stories are timeless in that they speak to um, so many gendered and racialized bodies of people of color in, in ways that I think sometimes people don't really consider. Um, and so I was just appreciative of the way the stories seem to not be sort of held in any particular era of, of life, but that um, they kind of just transform over the course of someone's life. Um, you, you mentioned so many things that I just literally had to, while I was reading the book, making marginal notes in the book, but then sort of going off on my own in my journal and just trying to expound on things like the injuries of inequality 
right? I just really was struck by that and sort of your framing of that as the mental, physical, and social toll of acute inequality, or I'm sorry, acute inequity. They are the cumulative markers and scars of economic and social marginalization, the visible and invisible evidence of disadvantage. And I just thought, wow, like what, what a way to even, you know, to, to Al's point, to contextualize the structural and cultural experiences of one's life in that way, to think of them as injuries of inequality. You know, there are also places where you know, you talk a lot about, and I think this was something that Vince had hit on, was this idea of the abuse and the trauma that so many of these women experienced um, um, at the hands of men and boys, frankly. And as a men's health researcher, there were times throughout the book where I was I read the stories and I actually had to stop and just take that in, you know, really, really just kind of let my, my mind wander a little bit about um, what I think you hit on in some places of the book, and that is the relationships piece and how important relationships can be for giving us some answers, essentially not just the what happened to these women, but the why it happened. Um, and so I just really appreciated digging deeply into some of those stories about these women and how for many of them, their relationships were, with men and boys were toxic, you know, and how that could have influenced, as, as Vince said, their decisions later on in life. Um, you know, just this idea of needing to hide and to find a way to not endure all the trauma and not be re-traumatized by remembering these experiences, but instead trying to find coping mechanisms based on what had happened to them. So that was just really powerful as well. Um, so there was something else that I just, I kept coming back to. So I, I found myself reading the book and I kept coming back to the theory and the way you framed the book in terms of, you know, um, the, the model if you will. And so given the fact that my work is on mental health, I, I see the book and the theory that you lay out um, mainly in sort of the bookends, the beginning and the end as a great model for how to deal with other health conditions overall. You know, I think thinking about things like depression and anxiety, you know, I think the way you talked about the dying from, the living with, and thriving despite of, I can see parallels across HIV AIDS, but also diabetes, you know, uh, just other health concerns. And if we can just think about, you know, what difference would we make in the world if we framed diseases and health challenges in that way, right? To really sort of frame health promotion programs, not just as health challenges, but ways to thrive despite of your health challenges. And so I think the public health professional in me was just like screaming, yes, yes, yes. Like just changing the narrative in spaces I think could really be truly transformative, which goes back to something that you said earlier in the book that I you know, made incredible marginal notes next to. You said the central goal of your book is to explain transformation. And I stopped there because when you think about diagnoses and when you think about when people get diagnosed with anything, right? Mental health challenges, physical health challenges, it's almost like their world stops at that moment. You know, they get the diagnosis and it's hard to imagine what life can be like after that. But I love how your, con your context of trying to explain transformation really speaks to what that life after the diagnosis can look like and what that thriving after the diagnosis can look, um, can look like. And I think particularly for people of color who are already faced with so many challenges um, and who for many, and this is something that you talked about a lot in the book, you know, seeing this diagnosis as um, just yet one more thing right, to be stamped on their back, some, you know, just another scarlet letter, if you will, to be placed upon them. It is just so important that we, as, you know, health professionals and scholars and people who work, you know, in this space with these, with these uh, people, the people that we care, you know, really care about, just think about the implications of how we frame the next steps for them and really think about it as, you know, this is today, but there is a life after this. There are ways to move forward. And here is how we're going to do that together. And here is how we're going to do that with a culturally sensitive, 
um, very age appropriate, and I'll even go as far as to say gender specific approach, right? So um, I just really valued hearing um, the voices of the women in so many ways and just hearing how they talked about their partners, how they talked about their, their health, um, how they talked about their children, you know, I'm thinking about Dawn and just her children, you know, from the book, I just, it was just so enlightening for me in so many ways. So um, the three points that I'm hoping that we can hit on are just things that I've mentioned already, but I'm just going to repeat them here so that we can go right into um, questions and a larger discussion is just the gendered and racialized bodies and spaces. You know, we oftentimes talk about women, we oftentimes talk about uh, race, but I really appreciated, you know, the, the intersection that you covered in the book talking about women of color in particular. That second point is looking to relationships for answers. You know, we often treat interactions and relationships as things that happen to us, but we don't often go into the why and the how and just the implications for how we can move forward, not just recovering from what that negative interaction may have been, but also thinking about, you know, um, how can we improve our relationships in the future? You know, how are ways that we can learn from our mistakes or learn from our negative interactions of the past to really look towards a brighter future? And then my third point is just thinking about diagnosis as pathways to healing, which I really saw as the undercurrent of your book. You know, I mean, even from the title to the to the bookends to just this was like the thread for me that went through every chapter. Just while diagnosis for these women was not a death sentence, it was a way to really focus on themselves and for them to really get the support and the health care that they needed. And I just really appreciated that and would love for us to consider other ways that we can think about diagnosis as a pathway to healing and not just as a place to stop, you know, the work that we're doing with people. So I'll stop there. Um, I might have gone a little under the 10 minutes, but I sense that will give us plenty of time for the discussion. It will give us plenty of time for question and answer, unless you want to treat us with a song or something to fill in. <laughs> no? Okay. All right. Then I'm going to sing. <laughs> Then I am going to turn it over. Thank you, Dr. Watkins. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Watkins Hayes. You have been celebrated, commended, awarded. What are your thoughts on what the panelists have shared and what are your hopes for the question and answer session? Thank you so much, um, Ashley and Tabby for putting this together and everyone else who, who pulled this group together. Thank you to my colleagues, the panelists. Um, what many may not know is that I just started at the University of Michigan in August. So honored to be part of the NCID community. And this has been my way to get to know my colleagues over Zoom. I knew Al before, of course, as a fellow sociologist, but, but this has been the way to, to get to know my colleagues. And I feel um, so much appreciation for the deep rigor and care that you brought to reading my book um, and can't wait to be in a room with you physically to to really um, you know hug you and thank you and just say that not only is this a wonderful discussion but this feels like such a wonderful welcome to the University of Michigan and I, I truly appreciate it I'm really honored to be among you um, honored to be part of NCID and honored to be at the university um, so where do I begin on, on these wonderful comments? And um, what I really appreciated is that you all captured the spirit and energy that I had as I wrote the book. Um, I was very invested in trying to understand women's stories. And I also wanted to think about not necessarily writing a book that just documented the injury right, that just talked about um, the stratification and inequity. Important as that is and key to capture it, but Al is right in terms of me wanting to also talk about dignity. And it was the women themselves that pushed me in that direction because from my first several interviews, I heard this um, discussion and this um, analysis of their own lives that I had to contend with. Me being a trained sociologist who's trained to look at and study inequity, was ready to talk about the health disparities, was ready to talk about 
um, how race, class, and gender and sexuality uh, occupy and um, work in their lives in ways that marginalized. But what I was surprised by, what I um, had to learn from the women was that that wasn't all of their story. So I had to use it as an opportunity for my respondents to tell me what their life stories were about and for me to try to build theory around that. And, um, you know, I, I have to pause and give credit to all of my amazing research assistants who worked with me and, you know, now have jobs and are close to finishing LaShonda Pittman and Jean Beeman and Robert Vargas and um, Dominique Adam Santos and uh, Courtney Patterson and Elise Kowalski um, and Marisol Master Antonio, uh, who, Ma Master Angelo, who really helped me puzzle through this of, I know that women aren't saying that HIV is a good thing because they're still dealing with challenge, but I've got to grapple with the fact that for some, there's economic stability. For some, there's a quote unquote, new lease on life. For some, there's a reconnection with estranged family, estranged family members. With some, it is moving into the public eye and being thought of as experts and thought leaders on issues related to HIV. So trying to capture both the inequity and the struggle that the women and the trauma that women had experienced and this other component of the story was really the central question. And you're right, Daphne, the, the research question became, I have to explain this transformation. I have to explain why someone would say to me from the first line of the book that, um, that that very haunting point that Dawn makes, if it weren't for HIV, I'd probably be dead. And I had to account for that sociologically and to understand that what she was really saying is the safety net that I had needed all along was provided to me through the HIV community. And if it weren't for the HIV community, I'd probably be dead. So the project had so many twists and turns and challenges because then I had to account for the HIV safety net. And I had to talk about this um, highly diverse group of people um, and figure out how in the world were they able to build an, 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 infra an infrastructure, a national infrastructure that is often being replicated in places all over the world, not quite in the same way, but is a model for um, so many places in the world. Um, that still has its challenges around inequity and still has challenges around its mar mar around marginalization, but essentially bringing it back to the theme of um, our speaker series, all of these forgotten lives coming together to save their own lives, to shape policy, to speak truth to power, and to figure out how to do it as a collective with all of its tensions and warts and debates that happen within the community. And I, I needed to make space for that um, and, and to highlight that. So when I think about this notion of forgotten lives, I think about women in particular, but especially Black women, forgotten in the initial framing of HIV in terms of our initial understanding of HIV focused on those initial cases that were documented among um, white gay men, not realizing that the epidemic was already affecting people of color, was already affecting women, and certainly affecting women of color. Um, so forgotten in the initial framing, um, forgotten in the policy responses, um, as the nation was pushed, as Vincent highlighted, by early AIDS activists and the ways in which the LGBTQ community saw HIV as an existential threat and took it on as um, something to mobilize around, but cisgender heterosexual women struggling to find their way in the policy agenda, struggling to um, figure out how they would become politically active when, as I highlighted in the book, the considerable risk of coming out as a woman living with HIV, what it might mean for you, what it might mean for your children, um, and what it might mean for your status in, in a community that hadn't fully grappled with the HIV epidemic as, as Kathy Cohen has so beautifully articulated in um, her book, Boundaries of Blackness. The third thing piece I think about when I think about forgotten bodies is their stories were forgotten. And that was something I was trying to recover as well. There was no black female equivalent of Magic Johnson. 
Black women came into Magic Johnson's story as what would happen to Cookie and who were the women that Magic was involved in. There, there, was, there was no other in-between status or no, a no other status for Black women to occupy in the, in the discussion. Um, there was no, you know, Elizabeth Glazer who was able to testify before Congress and push for money for pediatric AIDS research. So Black women and women of color had to find their way within that public voice and within that public conversation. And that was also what I wanted to, to document, whether it was, you know, thinking about Ray Lewis Thornton on the cover of Essence magazine to women who are becoming involved in public speaking through my work, look, looking at that. And then the other thing that I think about as it relates to um, forgotten bodies is the role of transgender women. And even the metamorphosis that the book took, because when I started doing the work in 2005, transgender women occupied a different space within HIV conversations, within LGBTQ conversations, within health conversations, um, the services, the research, they were all kind of lumped into the category of um, MSM, men, men who have sex with men, and were added almost as, as an appendage to that group and had to struggle and fight um, to be able to ex receive services, receive attention, receive care that was and is true to their gender identities. So as that changed, I had to reconcile that in my book because um, that they that community wasn't part of the initial study design. So even until the final throes of book writing, I was grappling with all of these tensions and you know trying to be so careful and mindful um, of this idea of making sure that my book wasn't yet another instance of forgotten lives that I didn't kind of perpetuate that in the process. So I'm, I'm just so grateful to hear um, how, how it was received. And I'm, I'm just gonna pull up a couple of um, your, your key concepts. Al, the focus on dignity, absolutely. And um, really trying to talk about both lost and recovered dignity, um, trying to um, situate women's individual experiences and lives and choices and struggles and constraints within a larger um, context, whether it's their social networks, whether it was the institutions in which they were embedded, whether it was the larger structural policy context um, and kind of macro structural arrangements in which they found themselves in as um, disproportionately low income um, women of color, but not, not exclusively in terms of what I write about. So trying to theorize around dignity, I think is really, really important. I've, I've been talking to students a lot about how sociologists, and I suspect all of our fields are, are this, we have documented um, seven ways to Sundays, the ways in which marginalized people are marginalized and the inequities and the struggles and the traumas. And um, I'm just so appreciative of this turn that we're making in sociology and I suspect in other disciplines to looking at um, dignity, looking at resistance, looking at resilience, looking at joy, looking at pleasure and being able to theorize and write about those things as a more kind of comprehensive way of understanding human experiences. So absolutely, I think Al, all great points Vincent, your point about sexual trauma, that too was a surprise to me as well. Um, I, I just didn't fully grasp how much sexual trauma is a major driver of the HIV epidemic, not to ignore the structural and institutional dynamics, but on the kind of interpersonal level. And what I suspect is that it's a major, uh, it's a major driver in a lot of the traumas that we later see. Um, I'm thinking about as people um, self-medicate through drugs and alcohol and food and violence and a whole host of things that we analyze. Um, I, I think that we all as social analysts need to find ways to think about incorporating sexual trauma into our analysis. And, um, and I, I know that, of course, gender and women's studies scholars, social work scholars have been doing this for a long time. And um, I think it's increasingly going to have to be part of what sociology um, takes up um, as one of the drivers of inequity as well. Um, 
the stabilizing force of the HIV safety net. I already, I, I spoke to that, the dynamics of, of the class. I didn't expect that as well for middle-class women to be so isolated as it relates to their HIV status. The fact that they didn't know anybody else was, who was living with HIV. Um, and they were really walking the path alone with a doctor that they saw maybe once every six months. Um, whereas for low-income women, and I write it in the book, privacy is a luxury they just couldn't afford. And it's got its, its you know, complexities, right? On the one hand, you're able to get access to economic resources and a huge social support network. I mean, women, you know, knew each other and were supportive of each other and were in conversation with each other. And then on the other hand, yes, you do have to forego a level of your privacy. Um, in order to be part of, of that world and community. So that was another kind of tension um, that I um, wanted to craft. Um, as it relates to Black men, Daphne, that, you know, in the epidemic, and I know that, that uh, many of us write about Black men. So I, I wanted to write a book about HIV among women that did not um, place the blame squarely at the feet of the men in their lives, right? and or, or didn't demonize. So, because when I started writing at the book, it was at the height of the whole down low discussion. And, um, you know, from, you know, talk shows to magazines, you know, it was kind of, you know, all the conversation. And I was trying to figure out, and I, I it sounds like I was able to do that because I really worked hard at it. And how do I give space to the sexual trauma and other forms of violence that women had no doubt experienced and um, that needed to be um, challenged and um, addressed and confronted while also recognizing that the men in their lives are part of a context as well and a context in which they too were struggling with sometimes their own afterlife of sexual trauma um, and violence within their lives where they were now, the victims were now victimizing others um, to place them within a context of economic vulnerability, to place them in a context of um, kind of community and network risk um, and to be able to hold both of those things in both hands as, um, as the, as I grappled with that is, as also the other thing I would add is targets of HIV criminalization. when We think about black men as well. So being able to account for both of those things, um, I, I thought was really important. And luckily there was literature that I could draw on by Sherry Dworkin and others who um, helped me kind of think through um, some of these dynamics and many people who have written about the, the down low phenomenon like um, E. Patrick Johnson and, um, and Jeffrey McCune and others that, you know, within the Black Queer Studies tradition that were really helpful. So um, the last thing I'll say, um, looking for pathways to healing. So, and this I think connects to all of what you're saying in terms of what I hope people are left with is understanding that it's possible to build a context of healing, that it's possible to build public policy, that it's possible to build institutions that allow for, promote, encourage, make space for healing. And Al is absolutely right, it is not fast work. Um, and I think that the challenge that we find ourselves in in the current policy moment is there's gotta be immediate outcomes. What are your outcomes? What are your outcomes? What are your outcomes? And how are you measuring them? When what the book reveals so clearly is that this is long-term, long-haul work um, that often takes place over the course of decades. But when it's successful, look at what we get, right? look at what we get, look at um, women who are able to remake and recover and look at how they're able to contribute and find voice and, um, and have lives for themselves that, um, that make them joyful. So um, my parting message is it, it's possible if we can think about and stay committed to the long hard work that it is. So thank you so much. And I look forward to um, the dialogue. All right, thank you for those comments, Dr. Watkins-Hayes.
Uh, we do have questions in the chat and a reminder that you are welcome to drop your questions in the Q&A preferably, but I'll find it if you drop it in the chat. Uh, let's start with a broad one for everyone. Examining the pathways that research participants take to reclaim and insist on dignity means exposure to great indignity and injustice. How do each of you practice self-care and personal healing in light of this vicarious trauma? And the question means are the vicarious trauma for us as researchers? For you as social scientists, yes. Oh. So I would be curious to hear what my colleagues have to say about this. Um, Cause I think that we've all probably from graduate school and perhaps even before have sat. And so I tell the story of the time sitting in so many graduate seminars and talks where, you know, the phrasing I use is you're watching and, and watching all the different variables and ways to measure how black folks are catching hell. And um finding your way as a scholar within that experience, I think is, um, is such a, a challenge. And I think that um, the, the way that I think about it is I try to think of the broader goal of the work and how I can be impactful. So Remaking a Life was yes, a book for colleagues, but it was always a book for the women too. And I was really, really clear that I wanted a book that my respondents could read because my first book, my tenure book was, you know, the dense theory and the let me show you how smart I am and all that kind of let me check off the box and all of that with, you know, the right press and all that kind of thing that they encourage you to do during the tenure process. This felt like, you know, yes, it's, it, it's important um, for me professionally, but I also want something where people in the community can read it and find value in it. And to me, the biggest excitement of, for me for Remaking a Life is how the, com the, how the outside community has engaged the book. The number of times I'm asked to speak at you know, a book club or an HIV support group or um, to help policymakers think through these issues and um, the, the way in which um, my respondents see me as a trusted voice and advocate and analyst um, to me, it, it, it is worth its, its weight in gold. Um, but absolutely that vicarious trauma is real and, um, you know, taking breaks and having a support community because, you know, now I have my support community of scholars who are in the trenches doing similar work, um, to lean on. So I think that's another important strategy as well to have that community. What would you all say? Well, uh, I'll jump in first, not because I have an answer, because I don't, but because <clears throat> I'll buy time for my fellow panelists. Um, it, it, I was thinking about that question as it came through. It's a perfectly fine question. Um, you know, there was the trauma that we were experiencing vicariously by reading and, and talking about Celeste's book this, um, this afternoon. But of course, I think all of us do work on um, issues of race and equality. Um, and so in the current environment, there's just a lot of that that we experience. There's a lot of that we become informed about and discuss. So uh, in an effort to be um, brief here, I'll just say that I guess if there's any strategy I've developed, it's just to try to compartmentalize. I don't know if that's healthy, but um, when I remember when I first started graduate school, I would get I would get you know hot and I would get upset when we we're okay. You're gonna talk about race. We can talk. Let's talk about race. And then I realized that's not. I can't sustain that over the long haul. I can't. That doesn't mean that I'm not uh, affected by discussions about inequality in the context of the political arena uh, or how it plays itself out in terms of the socioeconomic or public health arena. I am. Um, but I try not to make it personal uh, because if I do, then I kind of take myself off the board and I'm, I'm not effective as a, hopefully as a scholar who's contributing work on these questions. So I'm not sure if this is the best strategy uh, to employ, but the one I've tried to employ is, is straightforward compartmentalization. Mm -hmm. So I can jump in and, and say that, you know, um, I actually like your strategy, Vince. It, it, it has a lot to do with what I do as well, which is not take up every issue. 
And I think this is something we talk, we talk about a lot in social work is that things will always happen. There will always be things coming at you, um, whether it's trauma, whether it's microaggressions, or let's be clear, macroaggressions that are coming towards you. But you, you can't take up everything as your personal strategy, your sort of personal um, responsibility, because what I've learned is that doing that, um, it is incredibly exhausting. It, it drains you and it, it, just, it just weakens your spirit. And I'm always an advocate for um, protecting your spirit in these kinds of spaces and with these kinds of conversations. Also, I just so happen to know of colleagues, most of them colleagues of color, who have tried to be everything to everybody and have tried to take on every issue and they have died early. They have been diagnosed with preventable health conditions. And so um, we, we can't do it all, you know, we can't do it all. And sometimes as people of color, we sometimes feel like it's our responsibility to do it all. And I don't, I don't live by that creed. You know, I, I, I do what I can and I make sure that my family's taken care of and that, you know, the people who are in my house and my family, I try to prioritize them, but there are issues outside the house that we are not going to be able to tackle everything. But what we do, just do it well. Um, also in terms of self-care, saying no and not apologizing for saying no is very, very important as well in these, in these matters. I don't know, what do you think, Al? The last thing I'll say, I agree with what everybody said, um, and I particularly appreciate Vince talking about having an imperfect response because I was struggling to try to figure out what would be the perfect response to this question. But I support what everyone said. The, the other component for me is that I try to maintain a sense of patience and much in the same way in which I talked about the policy world, the social service world, having to have patience around change in human development. I try to understand that that kind of patience applies to the academic life. By that, I mean that I, I think as researchers, and, and I think the four of us, certainly others, but the four of us here, we do our analysis, we develop our findings, we would like the world to, as quickly as possible, understand what we're saying and why it's important, and hope that they'll think differently. I've been around long enough to know that that is really the case. It takes a long time to get certain people to think differently. It may take decades of work, work to do so. So to think about being a part of that long-term conversation rather than being frustrated by some of the things people say or do to me about my work in the moment. Doesn't mean I forgive everyone for what they say or do, but I try to hold on to the notion that change will take a while. And just to continue to be, as, as Marion Ray Edelman said at a conference many years ago, the flea that's scratching at that dog all the time. Takes a lot of fleas <laughs> to have an effect, but be one of those fleas scratching at that dog all the time. And that's what I use to sustain myself. All right, so happy that you're all finding ways, naming ways to sustain yourself. Hopefully our guests learned tools and strategies for that as well. A question, love all the way from the UK, from a person planning to start their PhD study in September, researching how ideas and theories of social and erotic capital work for people living with HIV AIDS. The question, I'm skeptical of the idea of thriving with HIV when many people living with HIV AIDS often cross several intersections of inequality. Does the panel think that it is easier for some demographics to thrive in ways that others can't and who might you suggest they are? Yeah, so that's a great question. So, so in the book, I talk about what I mean by thriving and I actually push back on the notion that thriving is about what sociologists typically focus on, which is socioeconomic mobility. So were there gains in income, education, um, occupation, wealth, et cetera. And that's how we often measure mobility. And the, the mobility that I'm talking about is, is very different because you know when we, when we talk about thriving despite, many of the women that I write about remain in poverty and impoverished. And I talk about that in the book. So when I think about thriving despite, I mean getting to a level of stability where one is not in constant crisis mode and getting to a place where one is able to be more agentic as she navigates through relationships and her families and communities 
and to start to be um, a change maker, to be able to influence the people around her and perhaps to even be able to influence public policy perhaps in, in those best instances. So for people who are coming from a place of extreme marginalization, um, who are in a situation where day-to-day -day survival is an achievement, given all of the barriers that they're facing, Thriving Despite is getting to a place where that kind of crisis is not as constant, right? It's not saying that it never happens, but it's not a day-to-day -day way of living. Um, and, and that's what I was fundamentally trying to capture. And I, when I talked about dying from, I mean dying from either physically or psychologically or um, in terms of um, economic needs, et cetera. And then when I talk about thriving, despite, I'm thinking about how do you get to a place of, of stability and to the point where you can start to um, articulate where you want to be and how you want, how, how you want to get there. Um, that goes beyond kind of the day-to-day -day survival. So the question about, are some groups better poised to do it than others? Absolutely. And I talk about in the book how, um, you know, when, when the safety net was first, when the safety net was built, for many of the people that were the imagined clients of the safety net, these were uh, white middle-class gay men whose lives were largely intact before they were diagnosed often with HIV. And of course they saw serious discrimination. They often saw loss of employment. They often saw rejection from families, et cetera. Um, but nevertheless, when they were able to move through the HIV safety net, a lot of times what they were returning to was a, was a life of relative privilege, right? And we've seen that bear out in the HIV epidemic. And we've also seen um, the LGBTQ community um, continue to talk about the inequities that, that exist within the community such that there's, a, there's still a need to engage on the HIV question, even though so many people who are living with HIV are now at undetectable viral loads and life goes on and they're looking at life expectancies that are um, pretty normal. So for that community, thriving despite meant returning to a place of privilege, economic, um, social privilege. Um, for the group that I worked with, women, thriving despite is actually getting to a place out of crisis, right? So obviously, that is not necessarily the ideal situation. And the, the point that we want to make in the book is, we're, I'm not arguing that having HIV is a, is a positive thing or a great thing. I'm arguing that in some ways, it's a testament to the flaws in our safety net that it takes an HIV diagnosis for people to get access to the services that they needed all along. There's a, there's a paradox to that, that we've got to grapple with in terms of the fragility of the safety nets that, that we do have. So for me, thriving despite is also a continual journey. It's not a destination, it's a continual process and people kind of move back and forth within it, but at least it's getting to a place where women feel stable enough to be able to articulate what is their larger goal? Where are they trying to go? And how are they trying to engage um, with systems of inequality that are different from their previous coping strategies, right? P coping strategies that might not have been as effective for them previously, whether it's ignoring their illness or self-medicating with drugs and alcohol or not using mental health services. Now we're interested in how women are using the services available to them to thrive, right? In a way that they define for themselves. Thank you for that question. And so excited um, about you coming to U of M. Please look us up when you get here. All right. And your response kind of got to this question. Um, your book noted some of the pro-social community building post-diagnosis, uh, but there's also community building around phenomena like bug chasing, where HIV AIDS is intentionally sought out so that individuals can feel like they're a part of something. What types of social or structural supports would replicate a sense of community within these broader injuries of inequality without or beyond a diagnosis? What are we missing in caring for vulnerable people? Yeah, th those are two great questions. So first I have to say, I didn't see any empirical evidence of, of bug chasing um, of the women um, that I studied. And um, I think that um, 
you know, when I think about the second question, so first, first response, I didn't see any evidence of the bug, of bug chasing. Second response in terms of how do we build this kind of community without needing the HIV status? You know, I go back and forth on this question because I wonder if part of it is you had to have the racial, economic, and gender privilege of white gay men to be able to move the needle in this way, to be able to claim the resources, to be able to claim the national policy conversation. And that happened through an absolute struggle, no doubt. Um, but nevertheless, um, being able to move the needle on that to the point that you know HIV remains um, you know, relatively protected in terms of its access to government resources and the Ryan White Care Act and, and the kind of durability of many of, of those systems. Um, so part of what I think about is, what that leads me to think about is, there, do, do we have to be in a place where the argument of marginalization alone is not enough? You've got to have a group that has some level of privilege to be able to move the needle, to be able to navigate those policy conversations. And um, through those experiences of privilege, more marginalized groups can, can kind of get those, um, get access as well. So um, on my more pessimistic days, I do think that it takes a coalition and there have to be people of privilege within the coalition. On my more optimistic days, I think about how we're looking at the Ryan White model and the HIV model. We think about the opioid crisis. You're seeing ways in which you know Elizabeth Warren and Elijah Cummings had actually proposed legislation to deal with the opioid crisis that mirrored a lot of what was happening in HIV. Um, but you could argue then there might be some um, privilege going on there as well. So that argument even gets complicated um, in terms of the understood constituencies of the opioid crisis. Um, even with COVID, there's conversation about, you know, how can we kind of replicate some of what the HIV safety net has, has provided um, effectively for um, people living with COVID, particularly long haulers who may need long-term care. So I'm hoping some of the lessons of the safety net can be moved into other places. Um, veteran services, I think, would be a good example. Um, so um, uh, I have a I've spoken to colleagues here at Michigan who talk about their work with veteran services and see a lot of similarities. Um, so I, I do think that there are ways that we can see whether this can translate into other contexts and communities. And then hopefully at some point we think about a kind of national, more national and robust strategy. Um, the move towards the Affordable Care Act and the hopeful continual expansion of it, hopefully, I think is um, evidence that there is a willingness to kind of think about broader and more holistic health care and social support and mental health services. All right, thank you for that. And your invocation of COVID-19 brings us to Brittany Williams' question. Brittany, thanks you for your work and has the book on the docket for next month. Uh, Brittany asks in part, what do you see as next? What will you do next to help with how we understand the HIV AIDS epidemic, especially since the World Health Organization has declared us off target for the 2030 goal to end the HIV epidemic as a result of COVID-19? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that um, there are some you know, we know that HIV continues to be an epidemic of inequality. And I think a couple of the things that we've got to think about, first of all, um, we are not seeing um, equal access to the tools to address HIV. So whether we're talking about PrEP, which is a, a medication that people can take who are HIV negative, that protects them and keeps them HIV negative. We see that PrEP take up is disproportionately happening among men and disproportionately happening among, um, happening among white men. Part of that is because of how the drugs were tested and who was in the clinical trials. Part of it is how the drugs were marketed. So now we're seeing a serious lag in terms of the women that I study not being, um, particularly women of color and just women in general, not knowing about PrEP, not having doctors and providers who are talking to them about PrEP. So I think you're gonna see a gap there. The second thing that I see you're, that you're gonna see a gap with is for people who are already living with HIV, 
um, we're only going to be able to close that gap and meet those goals of, um, of reducing the epidemic if we're able to make sure that people living with HIV get access to the medications that get their viral loads down to undetectable levels, because if their viral loads are undetectable, they can't sexually transmit. So that is a technique to stop the epidemic. We find that disproportionately people of color are not getting access to the healthcare and are not getting um, and are not being retained in care to get to those undetectable levels. Um, in the U.S. context, the epidemic has largely moved to the south, and particularly the southeast um, part of the region, um, where we're seeing, you know, in both large cities but also rural communities, the HIV safety net has not been built out there. So, if I would have done this study in the south in a different city rural or urban, I probably wouldn't see what I saw in Chicago. So um, the, we have definite gaps and slippages in terms of the robustness of the safety net, both in the US, but also abroad. So I would say those are the three things that are preventing us. And I, it, you know, it will, of course, be heightened as a result of, of COVID. So I'm trying to think through those issues and kind of work with colleagues on thinking about, you know, how, how do we effectively move forward, especially given the realities of COVID. All right, thank you. Allie Day teaches at the University of Toledo. Grants Allen, Shirley Murdoch, and Anita Baker from Toledo, as am I, if you were wondering. And Allie asks, if you found any concepts, ideas, public policies from critical disability studies or disability justice literature that have been useful for your work on women living with HIV? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's, that's a really great question. And part of um, one of the ideas that, um, that I try to engage in the book is thinking about how we come up with disease illness categories and how those categories are used in ways that distribute benefits in ways in, in ways that actually might be unequal and unequitable. So the frameworks of disability studies became really useful to me when I was thinking about um, the changing case definition of um, what constitutes an AIDS diagnosis. I write about it in the book. And I write about the ways in which because women were included in many of the studies of people living with HIV, how we understood the progression of HIV as an illness was based on how we understood how it progresses in men. So what was happening was that women weren't being categorized as having stage three HIV or what we know or what we call AIDS. And as a result, we're not getting access to some of the benefits and services reserved for people um, living, living with stage three HIV or AIDS. So I really liked the idea or took up the concept of um, how disease categories end up creating material resources and realities for people. Um, and how when our understanding of disease categories is, is flawed, it has significant economic and, and other implications. Thank you for that answer. And we have a novel researcher. What are ways to gain the trust of your respondents, especially when working within an institution that has historically supported the social inequities that we are trying to challenge? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I think the whole panel should uh, engage in that because we've all got to grapple with it. Um, a, a lot of it is, um, you know, and Vincent really talked about um, the length of time that it takes to develop trust and to understand the community. So for me, a lot of time had to be spent just understanding the language of the HIV community and what the key concerns were and what the stakes were and in a variety of different um, fights and struggles and to understand the kind of nuances of, of different dynamics. So um, I'm not saying it has to take a 10 year plus project to do it. Some of the reason my book took 10 years where they were, you know, as Daphne talks about, I didn't always say no when I should have to administrative and other projects. Um, so that lengthen the time of the work. Um, uh, so, but nevertheless, I think it's, it's important to invest the time and also to be out in the community. So I started, you know, volunteering as, you know, in, at an AIDS service organization, 
Um, I would give talks and still give talks to many HIV community organizations just to become a part of the community and to, and to learn as much as I can. Um, and I think that when you do that, people start to see you as opposed to the university and they're able to make that separation. And the other thing I did, and I talk about this in my book, this won't be appropriate for every project, but the, but the people who I wrote about extensively in the book saw what I wrote before it went to press um, because it's their lives that are out there. Um, and I was, you know, people wonder, well, do people try to change what you wrote? I was pleasantly surprised that nobody tried to change anything. And you saw how intense the stories were and people said this is my story it is what it is and um you know people corrected me on things like dates like no that wasn't 1985 that was 1986 things like that but other than that they said this is my story and um and i'm ready for it to to be out there in that way and i think developing that kind of relationship where people trust you um, and when they read what you wrote, they understand that you're talking about all of the dynamics that they're facing, I think um, builds that kind of relationship where they can say, all right, I'm ready to release it. What do you all think? How do you deal with this? Uh, well, for me, I, I primarily work on large end surveys. So it's a different story, but the way we, we as a profession, not obviously just me specifically, but survey researchers in general rely heavily on uh, anonymity. That is the, can, you know, the questioner rightly noted that um, institutions of higher learning don't exactly have the greatest reputation and for some good reasons in terms of how they've interacted with, uh, you know, marginalized populations. But one thing the profession has learned is that if we're gonna be asking sensitive questions and we do this on surveys routinely about any manner of different things, drug use, criminality, sexual activity, and attitudes about race, uh, we have to adhere to this standard of where this is an anonymous survey. We're not gonna be taking information about you, your personal circumstances. Uh, so that would be one. And then the second thing, and I'll end, is that we uh, also put forth this notion that you know if you encounter any question that you are uncomfortable ask, answering, you are free not to answer it. We're not going to force you to answer a question. So it's a it's a different, somewhat different universe than the one that Celeste is operating in, but it's still important that we establish in, in both cases some bonds of trust that we're not going to take advantage of you when we ask you these sensitive questions. Mm -hmm. I'll just add briefly. I'm sorry, Daphne, you want to go ahead? You go first and then I'll add to you. Um, being in, 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 in similar places, like Professor Watson Hayes, I'm, I'm in marginalized communities doing up close and, and, and direct research. I agree with everything that's said thus far. The other two points that I will add is that one, I don't overpromise. By that, I mean that people often ask me, so how is my family, my community, my world going to be different on the basis of research? And my immediate response is, I can't guarantee that anything will change. Other than you will get some conversation from me for being in my study, what have you. But then I go on to explain in much the same way in which I've tried to accept patience <laughs> in exchange of scholarship with the broader world, patience in what my scholarship may or may not do. And so I, I just don't overpromise. The second thing is I'm, I'm very explicit in inviting conversations with potential research participants about the university I employed by, um, what kinds of institutional connections they're concerned about or want to discuss. And one of the points I raise is that whatever history of problematic relationship might you might may have experienced that's only addressed by people like me or others trying to engage you and act and respond differently so a better future is only going to come about through people like me encountering you so i hope you're willing enough to, to, to make that happen so the only thing that i'll add is and i echo everyone's comments um the one thing that i'll add just to make sure that it's amplified is that it takes patience on behalf of on behalf of the researcher and behalf of the participants as well and i know sometimes our academic and professional deadlines don't always meet up with the time that it takes but i've learned over the years that you cannot rush relationships with participants you you can't rush rush that relationship 
you know, for a paper deadline, for a conference deadline, even for a book deadline, I'm sure, right, right, Celeste? So you, you can't really rush that. And so you will have to find some compromise with the fact that it takes time for them to trust you. And frankly, for you to trust them as well, you know, trust them to be honest and upfront about their experiences. But I know that's not always um, met with celebration on the academic side, but if it's really the work that you're wanting to do and you really see it valuable, then you're going to have to be patient with building that trust. All right, these were powerful, powerful reflections, um, comments, such wonderful engagement. Any final questions from you, Dr. Watkins Hayes, or from any of our panelists? I'm sorry, final responses or comments from any of our panelists? Yeah, I, I have a question for Celeste. I'm looking at the back of your book and I see you have, uh, you managed somehow to get Stacey Abrams to do a blurb. Now, can you explain to us how that happened? That's what I want to know. <laughs> That's the Spelman Network. So true story, Stacey and I went to Spelman together and we were student leaders. Stacey was the, sp the uh, president of the Student Government um, Association. And we knew then Stacy was going to do amazing things. And at the time, I was the student trustee, which meant I sat on the board of trustees. So there would be two students often in a boardroom at Spelman's um, at Spelman's board of trustees, Stacy and I. And um, we did that together and got to know each other and have been friends ever since. I could not be proud of her. And I will tell you, the Stacy you see now is th that's exactly who she was in college. Brilliant and dedicated and we knew she was going places. We didn't expect to this degree, but we knew um, that she had something special. So she um, is a supporter of the book. That is absolutely amazing. Did you touch her while you were at Spelman? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we like, you know. Oh, that's she, wonderful. We that's in each other's dorm rooms and I mean, you know, we're, we're buddies. Yeah. I touched her elbow once in DC, which is why I brought that up. Um, other final thoughts from the panelists. Leah, thank you for being involved in this conversation and an appreciation that we went so far beyond just the book, as important as the book has yeah. been to allow people to bring in other questions and concerns. And it really speaks to how the work allows us to think so deeply beyond the very topic at hand and that's the sign of great work and the piece that i'll add is you know you don't have to be you know an expert or interested in hiv aids or even black people or even women to get something from this book that's one of the things that i think um, i really appreciated about it, is there are just so many jewels throughout that can apply to other communities to other you know um, health concerns and and frankly just to other um just lives in general. So I just really thank you, Celeste, for putting together such a beautiful piece that I think is transformative in ways that I think are, are really, really helpful for readers. So You're welcome. You want to get the book. Yeah. <laughs> human, human experiences and lives. That was the goal. So thank you for saying also that that it it moves in different ways and through different communities and it's it's finding such diverse audiences. Um, that I've really appreciated that in diverse communities and, um, but everyone is really resonating with the, with the fundamental message of, you know, we all want to live our, I, to our, our, to our highest potential. We all want that opportunity. And um, how is it that we can build policies and structures and communities that allow for that um, and not just in everybody's life? Thank you so much for that. For those questions that we didn't get into, please, please, please get the book. I loved it. It took me about two days to make it through the book. It's an absolutely outstanding book. You're going to love it. It's going to inform your work, no matter how you structure yourself as a scholar or activist. Um, we have a quote from Kai, uh, just heartbreaking and illuminating is such a good phrase to describe how I felt reading this book. I read about trauma too often that leaves me feeling disempowered. This book was not the case at all. So we celebrate that and we celebrate you, Dr. Watkins Hayes. We let that thought inform our continued service to the symbolically and structurally forgotten. Stay in touch with us and expect updates on the next Forgotten Bodies conversation featuring W. Carson Bird and guests. 
Please help us build this and other NCID programming by completing our post event survey sent to the email address you use to register for this, this event immediately following our conversation. We thank you for your time. We hope that you remain safe and strong in the struggle. Thank you for attending today. Thank you for attending and thank you colleagues. This was just wonderful. So appreciate it. So appreciate it. Thank you, Tabby. So appreciate it.